Hello, hello, and welcome. So, just so you guys know, I am trying to do ASMR now, which basically means I want to be able to use my voice to help everybody relax and just listen to my words and be able to just imagine with me. And, um, yeah, I don't know why all of a sudden I was sitting here and I decided it sounded good. I want to give this a try. I see so many people doing it, and I figure, hey, let me get in on this game. But plus, I know that I've been told multiple times that I have a very nice speaking voice, and I've also been told, like, you have a very soothing voice. So I figure, if I have a soothing voice, I guess I can use it to help people relax and things like that. So basically, I'm going to start this off with, I'm going to be reading, like, short stories and things like that. I don't know if I'm going to get into the other things ASMR. I'm not really looking to get into the other parts of ASMR like that. But it's just the short stories that I'm finding online. And they sound interesting. And I figured you guys would want to listen to me read them. I mean, they're the short stories that I've been looking at, they're like short, short, like pages. Like one page or two page at the most. So I don't have to spend all day reading. But if... I can't fit it all in one video. I'm probably going to end up doing two parts because I usually don't have the time. But anyway, enough with all that. So the story that I am going to be reading is a story I found called Drinking Coffee Elsewhere. It's a short story published by ZZ Packer, whoever that is. And apparently it was published in 2000. So it says it's a story... A coming of age story about a young lady who's going to college or something so it's told from perspective of a female obviously and it worked out for me perfectly because now I don't have to feel awkward reading about a male or something so anyway let me go ahead drinking with coffee orientation games began the day I arrived at Yale from Baltimore in my group we played heady frustrating games for smart people one game appeared to be charades Reinterpreted by ex delicious. Another involved listening to rocks. Then a freshman counselor made everyone play trust. The idea was that if you had the faith to fall backward and wait for four scrawny former high school geniuses to catch you, just before your head cracked on the slate sidewalk, then you might learn to trust your fellow students. Russian roulette sounded like a better game. No way, I said. The white boys were waiting for me to fall, holding their arms out for me, sincerely, gallantly. No fucking way. It's all cool, it's all cool, the counselor said. Her hair was a shade of blonde I'd only seen on Playboy covers, and she raised her hands as though backing away from a growling dog. Sister, she said in a I'm down with a struggle voice, you don't have to play this game. As a person of color, you shouldn't have to fit into any white partial system. I said, it's a bit too late for that. In the next game, all I had to do was wait in a circle until it was my turn to say that what an object I wanted to be. One guy said he'd like to be a gadfly, like Socrates. Stop me if I wax platonic, he said. The girl next to him was eating a rice cake. She wanted to be the Earth, she said. Earth with a capital E. There was one other black person in the circle. He wore an Exeter t-shirt, and his overly elastic expressions resembled a series of facial exercises. At the end of each person's turn, he smiled and bobbed his head with unfettered enthusiasm. Oh, that was good, he said, as if the game were an ex experiment he set up with the results were turning out better than he expected. Good, good, good. When it was my turn, I said, My name is Dina, and if I had to be any object, I guess I'd be a revolver. The sunlight dulled as if on cue. Clouds passed rapidly overhead, press presaging rain. I don't know why I said it. Until that moment, I'd been in good, I've been good in all the ways that were meant to matter. I was an honor roll student though I learned long ago not to mention it in part of Baltimore where I lived. Suddenly, I was hard-bitten and, and recalculated. The kind of kid who took pleasure in sticking pins into cats. The kind who chased down smart kids and sprayed them with mace. A revolver, a counselor said, stroking his chin, as if it had grown a robotical beard. Can you please elaborate? The black guy cocked his head and frowned, as if the beakers in Errolman flask of his experiment had grown legs and scurried off. You were kidding, the dean said, about wiping all of mankind. That, I suppose, was a joke. She squinted at me. One of her hands curved atop the other to form a pink freckled molehill on her desk. Well, I said, maybe I meant it at the time. I quickly saw that it was not the answer she wanted. 
I don't know. I think it was the architecture. Through the dimming light of the dean's office, I could see the fortress of the old campus. On my ride from the bus station to the campus, I barely glimpsed New Haven. A flash crumpled building there. A trio of straggly kids there. A lot like Baltimore. But everything had changed when we reached those streets hooded by the good buildings. I imagine how the college must have looked when it was founded, when most of the students owned slaves. I pictured men wearing tight and knickers smoking pipes. The architecture, the dean repeated. She bit her lip and seemed to be making a calculation of some sort. I noticed that she blinked less often than most people. I sat there, waiting to see how long it would be before she blinked again. My revolver comment won me a year's worth of psychiatric counseling, weekly meetings with dean guests, and, since the parents of the roommate I'd never met weren't too hit on the idea of their Amy sharing a bunk bed with a budding homicidal loony, my very own room. Shortly after getting my first D, I received the knock, first knock on my door. The female counselors were never knocked. The dean had spoken to them. I was a priority. Every other day, right before dinner time, they looked in on me unannounced. Just check it up, a counselor would say. It was the voice of a suburban mother in training. By the second week, I had made a point of sitting in a chair in front of the door, just when I expected the counselor to pop up her, her head around. This was intended to startle them. I also made a point of being naked. The unannounced visits ended. The knocking persisted. Through the peephole, I saw a white face distorted and balloonish. Let me in, the person looked like a boy who sounded like a girl. Let me in, the voice repeated. Not a chance, I said. Then the person began to sob, and I heard a back slump against the door. If I hadn't known the person was white from the peephole, I'd have known it from the display like this. Black people didn't knock on strangers' doors, crying. Not that I understood that black people would yell. There was something pitiful in how cool they were. Occasionally, one would reach out to me with missionary zeal, but I'd rebuff that person with haughty silence. I don't have anyone to talk to. The person on the other side of the door cried. That is correct. When I was a child, the person said, I played by myself in the corner of the schoolyard all alone. I hated dolls and I hated games. Animals were not friendly and birds flew away. If anyone was looking for me, I'd hid behind a tree and cried out, I'm an orphan. I opened the door. It was a she. Plagiarist, I yelled. She had just recited a Frank O'Hara poem as though she thought it of herself. I knew the poem because it was one of the few things I'd be forced to read that I wished I'd written myself. The girl turned to face me, smiling weakly, as though her triumph was not in getting me to open the door, but in the fact that she was able to smile it at all when she was so accustomed to crying. She was large but not obese, and crying it turned her face the color of raw chicken. She blew her nose into the waist end of her t-shirt, revealing a pale belly. How do you know that poem? She sniffed. I'm in your contemporary poetry class. She was Canadian and her name was Heidi. Although she said she wanted people to call her Henrik. That's a guy's name, I said. What do you want? A sex change? She looked at me with so little surprise that I suspected she had discounted this as an option. Then her story came out in a teary, hiccup-like burst. She had sucked some cute guy's dick and he told everybody and now everybody thought she was a slut. Why'd you suck his dick? Aren't you a lesbian? She fit the bill. Short hair, roach stomping shoes. Dressed like an aspiring plumber. The lesbians I'd seen on TV were wired with thin strips of muscle. But Heidi was round and soft and had a moon-like face. Drab muck colored hair. And lesbians had cats. Do you have a cat? I asked. Her eyes turned glossy with new tears. No, she said, her voice wavering. And I'm not a lesbian. Are you? Do I look like one, I said. She didn't answer. Okay, I said. I could suck a guy's dick too if I wanted, but I don't. The human penis is one of the most germ-ridden objects there is. Heidi looked at me, unconvinced. What I meant to say, I began again, is that I don't like anybody, period. Guys or girls, I'm a misanthrope. I am too. No, I said, guiding her back through my door and turned to the hallway. You're not. Have you had dinner? She asked. Let's go to the commons. I pointed to a pyramid of ramen noodle packages on my windowsill. See that? That means I never have to go to commons. Aside from class, I have no contact with anyone. 
She said, I hate it here too. I should have gone to McGill. Uh, the way to feel better, I said, is to get some ramen and lock yourself in your room. Everyone will forget about you and that guy's dick. And you won't have to see anyone ever again. If anyone looks for you, I'll hide behind a tree. A revolver, Dr. Rayborn said, flipping through a manila folder. He looked up at me as if to ask another question, but he didn't. Dr. Rayburn was a psychiatrist. He had the gray hair and the whiskers of a Civil War general. He was also a chain smoker with big, with beige teeth and a navy wool jacket smeared with ash. He asked about the revolver at the beginning of my first visit. When I was unable to explain myself, he smiled as if this was perfectly respectable. Tell me about your parents. I wonder what exactly he had on file. The folder was thick, though I hadn't said a thing of significance since day one. My father was a dick, and my mother seemed to like him. He patted his, he patted his pockets for his cigarettes. That's some heavy stuff, he said. How do you feel about Dad? The man couldn't say the word father. Is Dad someone you see often? I hate my father almost as much as I hate the word Dad. He started tapping his cigarette. You can't smoke in here. That's right, he said, and slipped the cigarette back into the packet. He smiled, widening his eyes brightly. Don't ever start. I thought that the first encounter would be the last of Heidi, but then her head appeared in the window of Lindsay Chit during my Ch Chaucer class. Next, she swooped down a flight of stairs in Hawkness. She hailed me from across Elm Street and found me in the Sterling Library stacks. After one of my meetings with Dr. Rayborn, she was waiting for me outside health services, legs crossed, cleaning her fingernails. You know, she said as we walked around campus, you've got to stop eating ramen. Not only does it lack a single nutrient, but it's full of MSG. I like eating chemicals, I said. It keeps the skin rating it. There's also hepatitis. She already knew how to get my attention, mention a disease. You get hepatitis from unwashed lettuce, I said. If there's anything safe from the perils of the food chain, it's ramen. But you can, but you refrigerate what you don't eat. Each time you reheat it, you're killing good bacteria, which then can't keep the bad bacteria in check. A guy got sick from reheating Chinese noodles, and his son died from it. I read it in the Times. With this, she put a jovial arm around my neck. I continued walking, a little stunned. Then just as quickly as she dropped her arm and stopped walking, I stopped too. Did you notice that I put my arm around you? Yes, I said. Next time I'll have to chop it off. I don't want you to get sick, she said. Let's eat at the commons. In the cold air, her arm had felt good. The problem with commons was that it was too big. Its ceilings it was as high as the cathedrals, but below it was there was, was no awestruck worshippers, only 18-year-olds at heavy wooden tables chatting over veal patties and jello. We got our food taco stuff with meat substitute, and made our way through the maze of tables. The Koreans had a table. Each singing group had a table. The crew team set up a long table of its own. We passed the black table. The sheer quantity of Heidi's flesh insinuated just how white she was. How you doing, sister? A guy asked, his voice full of accusation, eyeballing me as though I were clad in a clansman's sheet and hood. I guess we won't see you until graduation. If, I said, you graduate. The remark was not well received. As I walked past, I heard protests, angry and loud, as if they were discovering a cheat at their poker game. Heidi and I found an unoccupied table along the periphery, which was isolated and dark. We sat down. Heidi prayed over her tacos. I thought you didn't believe in God, I said. Not in the God depicted in the Judeo-Christian Bible, but I do believe that nature's essence is a spirit that... All right, I said. I had begun to eat, and the cubes of diced tomato fell from my mouth when I spoke. Stop right there. Taco spirits don't mix. You always have got to be so flip, she said. I'm going to apply for another friend. There's always Mr. Dick, I said. Slurp, slurp. You're so lame. So unbelievably lame. I'm going out with Mr. Dick. Thursday night Atticus. His name is Keith. Heidi hadn't mentioned Mr. Dick since the, since the day I met her. That was more than a month ago, and we spent a lot of time together. I checked for signs that she was lying, her habits of smiling too much, her eyes bright and cheeks full, so that she looked like a chipmunk. But she looked normal, pleased even, even to me so flustered. 
You're insane. What are you going to do this time, I ask? Sleep with him? Then when he makes fun of you, what? Come pound your head on my door reciting the collective poems of Sylvia Plath? He's going to apologize to you before. And don't call me insane. You're the one going to the psychiatrist. Well, I'm not going to suck his dick, that's for sure. She put her arm around me in mock comfort, but I pushed it off and I ignored her. She touched my shoulder again and I turned, annoyed, but it wasn't Heidi after all. A sepia tone boy dressed in khakis and a crisp plaid shirt was standing behind me. He handed me a hot pink square of paper without a word, then briskly made his way toward the other end of comments where the crowds blossomed. Heidi leaned in and read it. Wear black leather, the less the better. It's a gay party, I said, crumbling the card. He thinks we're effing gay. <laughs> Heidi and I signed on to work at the Saybrook Dining Hall as dishwashers. The job consisted of dumping food from plates and trays into a vat of rushing water. It seemed straightforward, but then I learned better. You wouldn't believe what people could do with food until you worked in a dish room. Lettuce and crackers and soup would be bullied into a pulp, and a bowl of some bored anorexic ziti would be mixed with honey and granola. Trays would appear, heaped with mashed potato snow women with melted chocolate ice cream for hair. Frat boys arrived at the dish room window in messe. They liked to fill glasses with food, then seal them airtight onto their trays. If you tried to prize them off milk, off, milk Worcester sauce, peas, chunks of bread vomited onto your dish, room uniform. When this happened one day in the middle of a lunch rush, for what seemed like the hundredth time, I tipped the tray toward one of the frat boys, popping the glasses off so that the mess spurted onto his shield and sweater. He looked down at his sweater. Lesbo bitch? No, I said. That would be your mother. Heidi next to me clenched my arm in support, but I remained motionless, waiting to see what the frat boy could do. He glared at me for a moment, then walked away. Let's take a smoke break, Heidi said. I didn't smoke, but Heidi had begun to, had begun to because she thought it would help her lose weight. And as I head for the stack of glasses through the steamer, she lit up. Soft packs remind me of you, she said. Just when you smoke them all and you think there's none left, there's always one more hiding in that little crushed corner. Before I could respond, she said, Oh God, not another mouse. You know whose job that is. At the end of the rush, the floor mats got full and slippery with food. This was when mice tended to appear, scurrying over our shoes. More often than not, a mouse got caught in the grating that covered the drains on the floor. Sometimes the mouse was already dead by the time we noticed it. This one was alive. No way, I said. This time you're going to help. Get some gloves in a trash bag. That's all I'm getting. I'm not getting that mouse out of there. Put on the gloves, I ordered. She went and put them on. Reach down, I said. At an angle so you can get it in the middle. Otherwise, if you try to get it by its tail, the tail will break off. This is filthy. Ugh. That's why we're here, I said. To clean up filth. Ugh. She reached down, but would not touch the mouse. I put my hand around her arm and pushed it until her hand made contact. The cries from the mouse were soft, song like. Oh my god, she said. Oh my god, oh my god. She rested it out of the grating and turned her head away. Don't you let it go, I said. Where's the food bag? It'll smother itself if I drop it in the food bag. Quick, she said, her head still turned away and her eyes closed. Lead me to it. No, we're not going to smother this mouse. We've got to break his neck. You're one heartless bitch. I wondered how to explain that if death was un is unavoidable, it should be quick and painless. My mother had died slowly, at the hospital. They said it was kidney failure, but I knew that, in the end, it was my father. He made her scared to live in her own home until she was finally driven away from it in an ambulance. Breaking its neck will save the pain of smothering, I said. Breaking its neck is more humane. Take the trash bag and cover it so you don't get any blood on you, then crush. The loud jets of the steamer had shut off automatically, and the dish room grew quiet. Heidi breathed in deeply, then crushed the mouse. She shut up, disgusted. Now what? What do you mean, now what? Throw a little bastard in the trash. At our third session, I told Dr. Rayborn I didn't mind that he smoked. He sat on the sill of his open window, smoking behind a jungle screen of office plants. We spent the first ten minutes discussing the Iliad, and then whether or not the text actually states that Achilles had been dipped in the river Styx. He said it did, and I said it didn't. After we finished with the Iliad and with my new job in what he called the scullery, he asked more questions about my parents. I told him nothing. It's none of his business. Instead, I talked about Heidi. I told him about that day in Commons, Heidi's plan to go on a date with Mr. Dick, and the invitation we'd been given to the gay party. 
You seem preoccupied by this sore. He arched his eyebrows at the word. Sore. Wouldn't you be? Dina. He said slowly in a way that made my name seem like a long title. Have you ever had a romantic interest? You want to know if I've ever had a boyfriend, I said. Just go ahead and ask if I've ever, if I've ever effed anybody. This appeared to surprise him. I think that you are having a crisis of identity, he said. Oh, is that what this is? His profession had taught him not to roll his eyes. Instead, his exploration revealed itself with a tiny pursing of his lips, as though he just tasted something awful and were trying hard not to offend the cook. It doesn't have to be, as you say, someone you've effed. It doesn't have to be a boyfriend, he said. Well, what are you trying to say? If it's not a boy, then you're saying it's a girl. Calm down. It could be a crush, Dina. He lit a cigarette off another. A crush on a male teacher. A crush on a dog, for heaven's sake. An interest. Not necessarily your relationship. It was sacrifice time. If I could spend the next half hour talking about some boy, then I, want, I had to give him what he wanted. So I told him about the boy with the nice shoes. I was 16 and had spent the last few coins in my pockets on bus fare to buy groceries. I didn't like going to Super Fresh two blocks away from my house, plunking government food stamps under the hands of the cashiers. There she goes reading, one of them said once, even though I was only carrying a book. Don't your eyes ever get tired? On Greenmount Avenue, you could read school books, but that was understandable. The government and your teachers forced you to read them. But anything else was antisocial. It meant that you'd rather submit to the words of some white dude than shoot the breeze with your neighbors. I hated those cashiers, and I hated seeing I hated them seeing me with food stamps. So I took the bus and shopped elsewhere. That day I got off the bus at Govins, and though the neighborhood was black like my own, hair salons after hair salons of airbrush signs promising Arabist hairstyles and inch long fingernails. The houses were neat and orderly, nothing at all like Greenmount for every other house had at least one shattered window. The store was well swept, and people quickly checked the long grocery list. No screaming, no kids, no loud cashier, customer altercations. I got the groceries and left the store. I decided to walk back. It was a fall day, and I walked for blocks. Then I sensed someone was following me. I walked more quickly, my arms around the sack, the leafy lettuce tickling my nose. I didn't want to hold the sack so close that it would break the eggs or squash the hamburger buns, but it was slipping, and as I looked behind my, my, a boy my age, maybe older, rushed toward me. Let me help you, he said. That's all right, I, I set the bag on the sidewalk. Maybe I saw his face, maybe he was handsome. Enough, but what I noticed first, displayed on either side of the bag were his shoes. They were nice shoes, real leather, a stitch design, like a wit widow's peak on each one. Or like bird wings, and for the first time in my life, I understood what people meant when they said wingtip shoes. I watched you carry them groceries out that store, and you looked around like you're, you're lost. But like, you liked being lost. And then you walked down the sidewalk on blocks and blocks. Rearranging that bag, it almost gone to slip, and then happened it back up again. Uh-huh, I said. And then I passed my own house, and was still following you. And your bag was really like it was going to crash and everything. So I just thought, I know. He sucked in his bottom lip as if to keep her making a smile. What's your name? When I told him, he said, Dina, my name is Ces Cecil. And he said, D, because after C. Yes, I said, it does, doesn't it? Then, half question, half statement, he says, I could carry your groceries for you and walk you home. I stopped the story there. Dr. Ray broke it looking at me. Then what happened? I couldn't tell him the rest. That I had not wanted the boy to walk me home. That I didn't want someone with such nice shoes to see where I lived. Dr. Rayburn would only have pitied me if I told him that I ran down the sidewalk after I told the boy no. That I fell. The back slipped and the eggs cracked and the yolks running all over the lettuce. Clear antiemic, flu clear antiemic fluid coated the can of cinnamon rolls. I left the bag there on the sidewalk. The groceries spilled up randomly. When I returned home, I told my mother... And that lost the food stamps. Okay, people, I'm going to have to stop the video here because um, I have to get ready to go to work soon. Um, I hope that I'll be able to finish the second part. Um, 
sometime. Uh, I do have to go to work. So just guys, tune in, support me. I will upload the second part as soon as I get time when I get home from working. I usually work late, so I don't know when I'm going to get it done, but I will try to get it done no later than tomorrow. Leave comments, give me feedback, tell me how I did. Um, I know I messed up in a couple of parts, and I know there were some words that I had trouble pronouncing, but bear with me. It's my first time doing this. Okay, well, if that's all, then I will see you guys later. Have a good day. Bye.